Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News webinar. It's entitled, Understanding GMP Reagents and Their Role in Cell Therapy. Using human cells as therapeutic modalities is revolutionary and transformative for the practice of medicine. Indeed, cellular therapy is already beginning to have an impact in the treatment of cancer, multiple sclerosis, diabetes, and other debilitating diseases. But it's important to keep in mind that current practice and future advances in cell therapy must always be seen in light of good biomanufacturing practices and how to best apply current regulatory guidelines. And those are going to be the focus of today's webinar. I'm John Sterling, Editor-in-Chief of GEN, and I'm going to serve as moderator. But first, let's meet our panelists. Dr. Hillard Lazarus is professor and distinguished scientist in cancer research at Case Western Reserve. Dr. Lazarus is going to talk about important issues surrounding the use of cell therapy, and he'll provide examples of applications of the methodology. Dr. Jeffrey Chalmers, professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at Ohio State University, will discuss critical aspects of biomanufacturing operations, including those involving cellular therapy. Dr. Scott Berger, a principal at Advanced Cell and Gene Therapy, will address manufacturing and regulatory considerations when working with cell therapy products. After the panelists make their presentations, there will be a question and answer segment. Feel free to send in a question for our panelists at any time during the webinar. Type your question into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console, and then hit Submit. The panel will try to answer as many questions as possible. Dr. Lazarus will be our first presenter. Dr. Lazarus. Good morning. My thanks to the organizers for providing an opportunity to discuss clinical uses of cellular therapy. The uh, picture shown here is of uh, Dr. Donald Thomas, who was awarded the Nobel Prize for his pioneering work in stem cell transplant. And this uh, modality transplantation really ushered in the era of cellular therapy and it's been extended uh, to many, many other areas beyond hematopoietic cell transplantation, uh, predominantly for neoplastic diseases. This next slide shows that cell therapy has undergone an explosion in the last several decades. You can see here that during this 10-year period that there have been uh, many trials that have been uh, generated and undertaken in in this area. The left panel uh, shows the type of trial, and you'll see that for the most part it's an equal mix of phase one trials and phase two trials, although there is a small percentage of actually uh, randomized phase three comparisons. The right-hand side of the slide shows in this uh, elegant review the cellular source uh, gener uh, uh, origin for uh, the cells that are used in cell uh, therapy trials. And again, it's a, a, an approximate balance between autologous cells and allogeneic cells. Uh, slide indicates the potential clinical applications for cellular therapy. <clears throat> it's not all inclusive, but it hits most of the general areas. Uh, cells <clears throat> from uh, uh, in a cellular therapy context can be used to aid in the regeneration of damaged tissues or even repair damaged tissues or organs. Further, these cells have been uh, utilized or can be utilized to repair genetic diseases. There's been a large number of trials where uh, the cellular therapy strategy is to aid directly or indirectly, either in supportive care or in direct anti-cancer uh, initiatives, and I'll show you examples of both those later in the, pr in the presentation. These cells also can aid uh, in in providing uh, responses in, as anti-infection therapy or, in fact, blunt overzealous infections, as I'll show you later, uh, which uh, extends into the anti-inflammatory realm. And finally, uh, there have been gene therapy initiatives to deliver a certain gene that's of interest to either uh, provide a, a, a deficiency or an enhancement. Which 
uh, cells one uses uh, and how to go about it is quite complicated. Uh, in general, uh, most of the materials that use uh, the, at the start for generating or collecting cells are uh, blood, bone marrow, lymph nodes, fat, umbilical cord, or placental derived products. And depending on how this is done, this, it can be done at an individual institution, or it can be done by a, uh, a uh, commercial uh, vendor to generate sufficient cells. You'll hear more about uh, how this can be done. But as I said earlier in the large review, the cells can be autologous in origin. They can be from a related allogeneic donor, or they can be from a third party who doesn't have any genetic connection uh, to the potential recipient. This, uh, this uh, presentation doesn't have time to go into embryonic stem cells and induced pluripotential stem cells, but these are two other areas that are of some interest in cellular therapy. There's a lot more uh, uh, ethical issues and uh, a lot more complexity with those two cell uh, uh, products. And of course, whether one uses a whole cell or a, a cell that has been uh, modified either to make a vaccine of the cell or use parts of the cells uh, is an area of interest. And I'll show in my presentation examples of how this, is, uh, how this can be done. Central production versus on-site production is another area on which I touched, whether it's a, uh, a, a investigator-initiated trial where it's a sort of a home cooking operation, or whether this is a um, commercial entity that is generating large number of cells uh, depends on the specifics. And then finally, uh, I cannot overemphasize the use of preclinical animal models because this is not only where we do a lot of piloting for safety and for translation and to understand ideas, but also uh, programs such as ours actually go back and forth between the preclinical animal model and the clinical situation because the animal models can help us hone what we're seeing clinically and vice versa. <clears throat> Other issues, what is the growth media? You'll hear about this more from the other presenters. FBS stands for fetal bovine serum, and this is a uh, nice nutrient that has traditionally been used, but there are concerns of contamination of, uh, uh, of products and, in fact, inducing uh, anti-bovine uh, uh, antibodies in the recipient with repeated exposure. And so we're trying to get away from using fetal bovine and products such as platelet lysate and even serum-free media are used, and I'll show you examples. Uh, should the product be um, utilized fresh or thawed? Certainly we can freeze these cells, thaw them, and give them back, and there are specific issues that need to be addressed that I'll show you in subsequent slides. I've already touched on the issue of whether the cells should be given as one-time uh, or repeated dosing and how many cells does one give. And again, this is a very complicated area, as is tracking and imaging. Some cells are very hard to find, and the holy grail in many cases is to show that a cell goes from the infusion to where it's supposed to be, and that's not such an easy trick. We like to monitor, obviously, for toxicity, but also for potency and efficacy, and you'll hear more about that later. And finally, uh, one of the biggest hurdles is who's going to pay for this? Uh, it's a catch-22 because one needs to generate uh, pilot data to secure fundings, but, but the studies uh, with cellular therapy are complicated, and it's very hard to generate even uh, feasibility data without having funding. So it's, it's a... Uh, a, a difficult road to hoe in some ways. Now, one of the cells that our center has used extensively for more than 20 years, uh, among other cells in cellular therapy initiatives, is a cell referred to as a mesenchymal stem cell. I'm going to use this cell as an example because we <clears throat> have had a great deal of experience and the rest of the world has picked up on this and many trials are underway. This is a cell that is uh, a parasite and lives on the surface of uh, a um, 
uh, capillary. They have many functions. They're uh, highly selectively immunosuppressive. I mean by that they're not uh, going to provide uh, a, a blanket immunosuppression and lead to opportunistic infection, but they will quell specific re, uh, reactions. Uh, and they, the cells have been used extensively in the initial realm uh, to uh, prevent graft versus host disease, which is this allogeneic reaction from a donor cell to a recipient. This is a cartoon basically showing how this cell that is a parasite on the left in panel A showing how this star-shaped cell is sitting on a capillary throughout the body and when injury occurs the cell moves into action and undergoes a conformational shape change and then uh, becomes activated and the cell does many many things when, when it's activated as shown on, in panel B basically elaborating chemokines and cytokines that can cause uh, quality immunologic reaction uh, or result in uh, uh, other cells undergoing uh, various conformational changes, prevent apoptosis, and do other things. This is a necessary cell because uh, without having a, 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 an equivalent of a checkpoint inhibitor, uh, the immunologic reaction would go on unabated. And so this is a very important cell referred to as the guardian of inflammation. Cells are, these cells are being used worldwide, and this is a plot showing that these types of inherent stem cells uh, are being utilized in many countries uh, throughout the world and have a great deal of, of experience, such that in this particular review, uh, these cells have been demonstrated to be extremely eff effective uh, from a safety perspective perspective. In other words, the top panel showing that they don't uh, result, their infusion does not result, despite their immuno selective immunosuppressive property, uh, opportunistic infections do not result, which is not the case with other immunosuppressives, and they do not turn off the host's immune cell so that uh, re uh, inducing malignancy or causing malignancy pro uh, progression is not a side effect. This uh, a slide is from a very famous case that really helped uh, uh, bring attention to this cell in the field of graft versus host disease. This is a uh, plot showing on the on the uh, vertical axis on the left side the serum bilirubin and on the right side the number of stools per day. So liver injury and hyperbilirubinemia and diarrhea are both concomitants of graft versus host disease that can result in fatalities. And this is a famous uh, example of a, uh, a young patient who had a uh, haploidentical transplant from one of the, uh, the parents and the Allogeneic cells uh, resulted in causing severe liver and GI tract injury as shown uh, by elevation in the serum bilirubin and the number of stools. When the parent was uh, uh, had a marrow sample uh, obtained to grow mesenchymal stem cells and those cells were infused into the recipient as shown on the left, 2 million cells per kilogram. There was a marked quelling in the liver injury and the resolution of diarrhea to back to normal for a number of months. And Cox proof of principle uh, when uh, the symptoms of hyperbilirubinemia and diarrhea returned. A repeat injection now this time of a million cells per kilogram again provided significant uh, relief quelling the graft versus host reaction. It's been done now in, in many, many uh, settings. I'm showing an example here of, uh, patient, of a group of patients who received uh, mesenchymal stem cells from bone marrow that were expanded ex vivo and then given to other patients who had corticosteroid refractory graft versus host disease, potentially a fatal condition. And you can see that those patients uh, who responded uh, had a very good outcome and the overall survival in those patients who had complete resolution of the graft versus host disease have a much better outcome. There are uh, certain uh, other situations which one should draw specific attention to. I mentioned this earlier 
when one collects cells, sometimes they're given fresh, but sometimes for a variety of reasons, they're cryopreserved and prior to use, they're sawed, thawed and then administered. Uh, this very elegant uh, paper shows that there is what I term here freezer burn, that is with the cells being frozen uh, 200 degrees below zero or greater, when they're thawed, there is uh, a defect in those cells, and if one studies uh, carefully, you'll see uh, things like heat shock protein and other uh, phenomenon such that if those cells that are uh, infused uh, immediately after thawing don't have the same potency, they don't hit the ground running, and this uh, in series of investigators makes the argument that it takes uh, almost 24 hours for this uh, freeze thaw injury to be uh, fixed by the cell and they argue that cells should not be thawed uh, and infused directly and should be uh, uh, allowed to repair their defect uh, in uh, culture and then uh, infused. That's a very important point and a lot of work has gone into that. This is another area you'll hear a little bit more about later. FBS again is fetal, fetal bovine serum and in uh, some hands uh, the use of platelet lysates can provide the same nutrients to uh, s sustain the cells and help them grow uh, almost as good if not better in some cases than fetal bovine serum. serum. Platelet lysate is <clears throat> prepared from uh, discarded um, platelets that are donated for clinical use, and there's an outdate of usually five days or uh, around that time, and they're usually discarded, but platelets make platelets arrive growth factor and other chemokines and cytokines, and under the right conditions, these platelets can be pulled and made into this uh, uh, substance that can be used to support mesenchymal stem cells and other cells. And you can see on this curve that the um, cells grow in, in platelet lysate actually, in terms of doubling, uh, may outperform fetal bovine serum. This is an example of a rare condition, but showing that uh, a culture expanded bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells when given intravenously can repair a defect. There are many of these. There's a recent report of repairing a defect in, in, uh, a, uh, in the lung. This is an older publication showing that the uh, patient is the, is the patients uh, who had a uh, allogeneic transplant and experienced a colonic perforation and peritonitis after an, autolog after an allogeneic transplant was quite sick. You can see the arrows point to free air from the colon and after infusion of the uh, mesenchymal cells, uh, this free air which, mig which migrates up is no longer apparent on the lateral uh, film of the patient, again indicating these cells got injury and can go in and do repair. Now our group has had lots of experience with mesenchymal stem cells and other cells in various conditions and one of which is in another kind of inflammatory situation, in this case multiple sclerosis, which is a type of autoimmune disease in which the T cells of the person in question for unclear reasons, uh, as shown here in the red, attack the axon uh, myelination, in other words, the insulation that uh, keeps uh, the nerves functioning like wires is, is damaged because uh, the oligodendrocyte that makes this myelin uh, are attacked by T cells and the uh, use of uh, culture expanded mesenchymal stem cells in our hands from uh, bone marrow uh, can be used to blunt the immunologic uh, attack. And this is just a plot from a 25 patient study that we performed showing that this uh, approach is safe and feasible in the uh, multiple sclerosis setting. This is another <clears throat> how to use cellular therapy. There are many. Our center also has a number of uh, vaccines uh, that we generate using a variety of cells and then administer these uh, whole vaccines to patients for a desired effect. This specific trial is being done at the national level through the Blood Marrow Transplant Clinical Trial Network. Basically, the idea is to fuse a, a dendritic cell of the person, that is a autologous cell, with a sample of a person's own tumor. In other words, educating uh, the person's 
dendritic cell against the person's own tumor to get rid of the cancer. And you can see here on the right side, this is, results in a fusion cell. Uh, this is a basically an activated uh, dendritic cell from the yellow dendritic cell that's obtained, uh, fio, froze, uh, fused with the uh, person's uh, myeloma cell. This is a complicated schema showing the uh, way this is done on this clinical trial, BMT1401. Basically, the subject in question undergoes a leukophoresis where mononuclear cells are then obtained and uh, changed into dendritic cells in the uh, laboratory after exposure to GMCSF and interleukin-4 and TNF-alpha and having now made these dendritic cells going back into the freezer <coughs> thawing in the yellow myeloma cells that were obtained in this patient who has myeloma and freezing these two together creates this uh, dendritic cell fusion product which is essentially immunized uh, an, an immunization against the, the myeloma and then these cells are administered to a person after undergoing an autologous transplant. This is a trial that's uh, active uh, underway. My final two slides are uh, another cell uh, where we're using uh, to combat cancer. This is a very elegant work from Julian Kim at our medical center in which it's been recognized for a long time that people that have the malignant melanoma uh, skin cancer may will have an immune response. Uh, that is, <clears throat> the cells uh, from the uh, host will go uh, uh, try to attack the malignant skin cancer and will often localize in lymph nodes but for whatever reason either insufficient numbers or blocking they're not effective and what we show on this slide is we're collecting lymph nodes from a draining uh, cancer that contain these uh, anti uh, uh, anti-melanoma cells. They're put into culture and you can see in this ex vivo T cell processing schema with interleukin-2 and anti-VGF, they can be expanded uh, more than 200 fold from a 50 million starting point to over 9 billion cells and then they can be uh, infused into the subject. And on this uh, final slide, uh, you'll see that the uh, plan is to use increased dosing and increased infusion numbers, which is the subject I talked about before. How many cells do you have to give and how often can you give them? These are all phase one and phase two questions. So um, I'm now going to uh, turn over the uh, uh, program uh, back to John. Thank you, Dr. Lazarus for that superb overview of the key issues regarding cell therapy and for illustrating a few applications of this promising new approach to the treatment of disease. Much appreciated. If you are just now joining our webinar, thank you for tuning in. There will be a question and answer segment at the end of the presentation. Please type your question into the box on the left-hand side of your console and then hit submit. Our next speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Chalmers. Jeff? Uh, thank you, John, for the introduction, and I would now like to transition our presentation from the actual clinical use of cells to how do we make the cells. In particular, I wish to present this from the perspective of a uh, bioprocess engineer. And what I also wish to do is make this presentation in the perspective of now approximately 30 years of uh, animal cell culture, commercial animal cell culture, where historically it has focused on the product from the cells, i.e., probably most famously, the monoclonal antibody products, now to the situation where the cells themselves are the product. So we can build on all this past knowledge, but there's a lot of unique aspects that we all need to be concerned about. In particular, though, to start off, I like to give presentations like this and say that the ultimate goal for us as a bioprocess engineer is to design a process that provides an optimal environment for our biological system. And that goes further because basically what we are trying to say is we need to take into consideration a whole number of issues, including thermodynamics, process kinetics, interfacial phenomena, transport phenomena, uh, 
And all of these previous topics are pretty much independent of the scale you work at. However, the transport phenomena, fluid mechanics is not, and that is where the challenge comes in. So a typical situation is shown here. You, can, you are given a cell system or a product, and it is, performs well in a T-flask or a very small vessel, and you need to scale this up to a larger scale production, as we just heard before, and in this case, to inject into humans. How do you do it? Or alternatively, you have a moderate to large scale system it used to work well and something changed and now it doesn't. The question is, what do you do? What do you need to worry about? And both, a number of these situations come up all the time. I've had many discussions with uh, practitioners dealing with this. Um, ideally, when you scale up, you would like to conserve the local environment. You would like the local environment and your little tea flask to be the same in the large-scale system. That's sort of an obvious statement, but it's worth repeating. You would also like to have no cell or process damage. You have economic questions. You can't or as you will, as we will all find out, it's not practical to have 10,000 5 mil T flask running. And finally, there's always something else that comes in that you are not ready for. Many examples exist over the last 30 years, including people using different media bags and having issues with the, the bags at large scale and not seeing it on small scale, just to give you a way out there example. Um, with respect to, though, the question of transport phenomena, fluid mechanics, or in the scale up, the term shear sensitivity has existed and continues to exist in this field and will probably be around for a long time. Susceptibility of animal cells to damage as a result of hydraulic forces is probably also one of the most misunderstood topics in animal cell culture. We would like to be able to, again, as I've said, preserve the local environment. However, fluid mechanics is a highly nonlinear phenomena. And just as an aside, airplane industry still heavily tests experimentally their systems. Same with ships and submarines. We are not at a point yet to completely mathematically understand it. That brings up this slide. We would love to be able to write the equations or put them in a the computer and solve for what we need to do. People are working on that, but we still, at the most fundamental level, do not have sufficient mathematical capabilities to do that. So we rely on empirical studies, rules of thumb, and the general knowledge in the community. And some of these rules of thumbs include First rule of thumb, generally speaking, anchorage-dependent animal cells are more shear sensitive than suspended cells. And I really wish to emphasize this point. What the animal cell culture community that makes protein products discovered 30 years ago and continues to this day and partially is responsible for the large success of the field is the fact that CHO cells in particular can grow in suspension by themselves and they're not nearly as sensitive as people thought. However, not all, but a good portion of the cells proposed for cell therapy, including mesenchymal human stem cells we just heard about, require growth on a surface, or we use the term anchorage dependent. Consequently, a whole new host of questions are, enter in. Now, I don't want to give the idea that this problem is not currently dealt with. In fact, most vaccines are still made in cells that need to be anchorage dependent. So the community has been dealing with this for a long time, just not at the scale that might come about with the rise of cell manufacturing for cell therapy. Um, okay, a second rule of thumb is that without the use of shear protective additives, sparging, which is just the introduction of 
typically oxygen or air into the culture for oxygenation and CO2 removal will kill the cells in a really short period of time. However, we have all discovered in this community that by addition of certain types of surfactants, we can prevent the adhesion of cells to these bubbles, and that made a big step in making the whole process economical and feasible. Another rule of thumb is marine impellers will create less shear damage to cells than a Russian-type impeller. This gets into some real weed specifics of how you design your vessels. However, even these two types of impellers have been shown to work fine as long as you operate them correctly. Um, this, again, becomes a big question with cells of microcarriers and a much more of a challenge, which we'll briefly address later and opens the door for a whole host of literature and questions to be asked. Uh, fourth rule of thumb, while gas exchange can be accomplished with membranes or silicon tubing, the simplest and most straightforward method is still to sparge gas directly into the system. There has been a fair amount of discussion that we still might be able to get away with not actually putting bubbles into systems for cell therapy or cell manufacturing applications for cell therapy. That is still an open question because it's going to depend on the scale to which the amount of cells are needed. Okay, so let's get into a little more of the weeds here and speak of a fundamental approach or a central hypothesis by which one can scale up or think about scaling up. As I mentioned before, we wish to conserve the local hydrodynamic energy dissipation around a cell. That is put in a simple way is just how much energy is being dissipated around the cell in the terms of the fluid forces. And obviously you do not want to have local areas that are very high. Um, in addition to that, we worry about what's called degrees of vorticity, how much the fluid is spinning or rotating, whether, as I mentioned before, this, the cell is attached to a solid or gas liquid interface. And then finally, one also needs to be concerned about the type of cell. In fact, it's deceiving sometimes to think that, well, it's been done in this cell system, it can be done in another. Sometimes that's true, sometimes it's not. For example, Cho cells are tough. It's much to many of us, surprise many of us, though, is there's a number of blood cancer cell lines which can grow in suspension, which are noticeably more sensitive. So a, an important criteria in all of this is to understand your specific system and attempt to characterize that before you scale up comparing to other cell lines. Um, all right, we like to use, and not just my lab, but the community, like to use a concept called energy dissipation rate. In some ways, it's very complex. In the other way, it's very simple. It's a scalar quantity, which means it's just a amount of watts per a given volume. You can think of it as how many watts your agitation motor is consuming, and it's how is that energy being dissipated into the fluid itself in the mixing. Um, it is, though, very important to understand that this hydrodynamic energy dissipation is very, very strongly um, a function of the location within the vessel, and the way that energy is dissipated is not at all linear or uniform. And I think that's a really key criteria. You can come into the lab and look at your little uh, reactor and see how agitated it is and think, gee, those cells are really being agitated. When in reality, if you were sitting on the cell zipping around inside your vessel, you would probably not notice it that much, except when you hit a couple small areas. And that is sort of the challenge of this field is to map and understand that. This graph is an attempt from a number of publications over the years to quantify just what I was talking about. If you look, first of all, in the middle, there's a, there's a line. That corresponds to this energy dissipation rate, and you'll notice units of watts per cubic meter. Uh, the arrows underneath the line refer to values that have been measured and recorded and published from a variety of researchers over the last probably 40 years, really. And the top above the line refers to 
published studies showing at what level of energy is the patient rate one can start seeing damage. Um, this helps guide you in your choice of vessels and how to operate them. For example, quick summary, if you look at the top, if you get very high energy dissipation rates on the right-hand side, you can damage and kill any cell line you want. And you see underneath it, that says when a bubble ruptures at the gas local interface. This is a very well-documented phenomenon. You obviously stay away from that. The other side of the scale is very low values, which is the typical average ev um, agitation in a bioreactor. And you can see your orders of magnitude below what can damage Cho, Vero, and human mesenchymal stem cells. And then finally, in between that, there are beginning to emerge reports of chronic non-lethal effects being recorded. So obviously, you want to stay away from that, but operate in the lower levels. All right. Some initial data is beginning to emerge, both published as well as soon be published work, which is attempting to begin to compare human mesenchymal stem cells to other traditional cells. For example, in this slide here, I'm referring to Vero cells, which are and have been used for a number of purposes, including some vaccines. They are an Anchorage-dependent cell line, but immortalized, and they're a real workhorse cell line. What we have noticed, and other people have as well, is that mesenchymal stem cells grown in microcarriers behave very similar to Vero's, which is a very good thing for the community. In fact, we found that the human mesenchymal stem cells are very robust and grow quite well. However, and this is a caveat, which it adds to the complexity of this field and is so typical that I and many of my colleagues have observed, and they, everyone blames sheer sensitivity for bad performance. In reality, we found no. Human mesenchymal stem cells grow great when they're in low passage, but as you get to higher and higher passages, they begin to slow down their growth, which is well known. But we also found them to be very shear sensitive. So you could scale, potentially scale up a system, get to a larger scale bioreactors, but being later generation because of this scaling process, and start seeing shear damage and blame it that the cells are shear sensitive, when in reality, no, it's because the cells are getting later in passage. Classic example of not understanding what the real cause is. I put this slide in here just to remind the community to be careful as well that it has been shown that even with protective additives, cells on microcarriers, which are what these photos are, can, can still result in bubble uh, microcarrier cell interactions, even with protective agents. Upper left are just bare microcarriers. They can agglomerate the black dots correspond to bubbles. And over on the right over here, you can see also the black dots are bubbles rising with microcarriers, the more clear spheres with cells attached to them. It's not clear yet in the community what we're going to do about this because if, in fact, we need to do a lot more sparging introduction of gas into the system, we might need better protective agents. So that is an open question. Uh, so getting near the end here, I just want to sort of formalize and review some concepts. This is your typical bioreactor. Here you've got a motor that you're introducing, some sort of a mixing agitation to it. We tend to think of it measuring it in some sort of a... a in this case, kilowatts or horsepower measure. It's how much of that energy is being distributed within the vessel that's important. Obviously, you would like to have it as even and as consistent as possible to keep the environment mixed and happy for the cells. The challenge is doing that and keeping it below the levels that damage cells. If you now want to start peering more deeply into it, here are some of the flow patterns, the different impellers can create within the system, and this is where I mentioned the idea of discussing with the community, practitioners in the community, to find the best system for um, your specific scale-up needs. 
And this is just to give you an example of all the different types of commonly used mixing impellers. The upper left is probably one of the, one of the more well-known systems that people are acquainted with. That it would be what you would see in your typical spinner vessel. Um, but all these other systems have very unique and are used properties uh, in the animal cell culture community, depending on what you need to do. I also wish to highlight behind any one of those impellers, including the classic spinner vessel paddle system, this is, you could argue, this blade right here represents any of those types. As it's moving in the direction the arrow is pointing, you get what we call vortexes forming behind the blade. These are these areas at the tip of the blade above and below it. This is where it's been well documented that a majority of the energy is dissipated. So the key is, is to keep those zones lower than what will damage cells. And when it comes to cells for cell therapy purposes, that means cells grown on microcarriers usually. And you do not want them removed from your microcarrier until you're ready for harvest. So this probably is the design focus that I would imagine the future will be a major topic in scale up of cell therapy. Now the other caveat on that is in the immune cell therapy world, such as the CAR T therapy, it is probably most probably going to turn out that those cells do not need to be attached to microcarriers at all. In which case. Pretty much the traditional animal cell culture field will apply in terms of all the principles. And in many ways, the community should be able to rapidly scale those systems. So to summarize, historically, now speaking over a 30-year period of time, the commercial aspects of animal cell culture have been um, facilitated greatly by the fact that CHO cells, insect cells, and zeros, which are the real workhorses, are relatively tough cell lines and are routinely cultured up to 20, 30,000 liters in incredibly high productivities. And the field is continuing to push that. So there's a tremendous amount of pragmatic knowledge out there for this field. Uh, however, there's still definitely room to increase both the mixing as well as attempts to increase transport phenomena. And this is going to be needed because the community is continually pushing productivities higher and higher to cut costs. Uh, cells used for cell therapy, such as the human mesenchymal stem cells, have to be grown on surfaces, typically microcarriers. So this is doable, but it's definitely another level of challenge beyond what we have historically had for the biopharmaceutical industry doable, but it's going to need some work. And finally, our initial studies show that the human mesenchymal cells are pretty tough relative to cells such as Vero and other ones. And so we do not foresee a, what you might say, a hardcore barrier towards implementing this. It's going to be a challenge, though, because they are still passage limited, this is human mesenchymal cells, as well as needing, in this case, for the cells to be the product, you need to remove them from your surface, in this case, mark carry without damage. Um, this, is a, toward, this is effectively the end of my presentation. However, there is, I didn't put on the slides here, but there is a significant amount of literature on these topics that go into much more detail than I've been able to briefly cover here, and I encourage people to contact us further to get references to help guide you further. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for that detailed discussion of the important manufacturing considerations that need to be taken into account when producing biologics, including cell therapies. I often feel biomanufacturing gets overlooked in the drug development process, so thanks for that excellent presentation.
Just a reminder that there will be a question and answer segment at the end of the next presentation. Please type your question into the box on the left-hand side of your console, and then hit submit. Our final speaker is Dr. Scott Berger. Scott, floor is all yours. Hello, and thank you for that uh, very gracious introduction. I'd like to uh, talk for a little while about manufacturing cell therapy products and in particular raw materials for cell therapy products and uh, regulatory considerations for them. In general, regulation of cell therapy products reflects the complexity and the dynamic and evolving nature of these novel biologic, uh, living biologic products. Regulations set a framework of criteria that uh, one has to meet. Um, these criteria include safety of the product, um, its identity and purity and potency, um, and perhaps most fundamentally, clinical efficacy. Um, in order to uh, determine whether these criteria have been met, however, it's necessary to take a somewhat flexible regulatory approach. Um, regulatory agencies overall follow a very science-driven and risk-based approach in assessing the effectiveness of a cell therapy product in meeting uh, these criteria. In other words, in whether or uh, whether and how these particular criteria have been met. Safety, identity, purity, potency, efficacy. Now let's consider the raw materials used in manufacturing cell therapy products. Perhaps most fundamentally, the cells and tissues that we use um, to create the living biologic. These are our living raw material, and they may come from uh, the patient or they may come from an allogeneic donor. In general, however, we have to meet criteria for um, donor eligibility, for tissue traceability from its, point, from its origin to its final disposition. These are covered under good tissue practices, Code of Federal Regulations 1270. Um, for allogeneic products, we have to um, conduct safety testing for infectious diseases. Communicable, di communicable disease testing requirements are essentially those for screening blood donors. Um, if we are generating an allogeneic, um, or for that matter, an autologous cell bank, um, we have to qualify the cell bank by safety testing and characterization testing. And this testing is not uh, particularly different from that of any other master cell bank. And it involves testing um, for identity, for purity, for um, certain infectious diseases, and so forth. Um, in general, however, um, safety testing for cell therapy products regarding, as regards infectious diseases relates to um, the kind of screening that we would do for blood donors. Now, then we get to um, uh, raw materials um, that are not the living biologic, that are not the cells and tissues. And these fall into two categories. These are either ancillary materials or excipients. Ancillary materials are by far the most numerous in a cell therapy manufacturing process. These are materials that are used in the manufacturing process but are not intended to be present in the final product. These are things like culture media and supplements, cytokines, um, uh, interleukins, uh, growth factors, things like that, um, cell separation reagents like FICOL and so forth. So. Um, the crucial point to remember, however, is that these ancillary materials are defined as materials that are used uh, to make the products but are not supposed to be in the final products. They have to be removed or diluted away. The second category of raw materials, um, excipients, uh, is comprised of raw materials that are administered as part of the final products, and these help the product function, help maintain its quality attributes, things like the balanced electrolyte solutions that are infused with the cells, or cryoprotectants if those are infused along with the cells. And as you can imagine, the quality requirements for excipients are the most stringent of all, since these are things that are actually going into the patient with the cells themselves. Now, if one is filing an IND um, 
to FDA, in other words, an, uh, an application for permission to conduct a clinical trial of an experimental therapy. One needs to provide certain information about the raw materials being used. This is done in a raw materials table. Um, we list the source and the supplier of each raw material and its grade, that is to say a measure of its quality. Um, is it clinical grade, is it research grade, and so forth. What concentration is it being used at? And is it intended to be used as an ancillary material or as an excipient? We need to um, describe our qualification program for raw materials. We'll talk about that in the course of the next couple of slides. Um, but fundamentally, raw materials qualification is about qualifying the suitability of a raw material of a reagent. In other words, does it perform as expected, as needed in the manufacturing process? We need to demonstrate that we've ensured the quality of raw materials. For each raw material item, we need to have specifications for its safety, for its purity, for its potency, or we may be able to make life simpler by referencing a master file. If the manufacturer of that raw material has a master file at FDA, um, we can obtain a letter from the manufacturer um, giving permission to cross-reference um, that master file so that when the IND application is reviewed by FDA, they can open up the master file that they already have for that reagent and see information about its safety, its, uh, um, its specifications for purity, and so forth. Each raw material needs to be approved through in-house testing, and by that we mean each lot of raw material, each lot of um, growth factor, or each lot of, um, uh, of a culture medium needs to be approved through in-house testing or um, through at least review and verification of the certificate of analysis of the manufacturer's testing. Depending on, um, uh, and we'll follow a risk-based approach to determine whether we need to do in-house testing, and if so, how extensive, or whether it's simply um, sufficient to review the COA. So how do we source and qualify our raw materials for use in the cell therapy and manufacturing process? Well, first, we want to use the highest level of quality obtainable for a reagent. And ideally, that means an FDA-approved clinical grade reagent. If not, if that's not available, then we need to use the highest level of quality obtainable that may be research grade and qualify it up by testing to demonstrate that it's suitable. Note that even if we are using an FDA-approved or clinical grade reagent, we may need to do additional testing to demonstrate that it works in our manufacturing process in that the testing that was done to, um, to achieve the FDA approval may not support the use of the material as used in our manufacturing process. We need to demonstrate that that raw material works in our manufacturing process. We also need to qualify, in addition to the materials themselves, suppliers of the raw materials. So we need to qualify, uh, we, and we need to demonstrate as part of that qualification that the material works for our manufacturing process. In general, we want to avoid animal origin raw materials whenever possible. Um, they uh, add significant additional risks to the manufacturing process. If animal origin raw materials are used in the research manufacturing process, then we need to explore recombinant or, in any case, non-animal derived raw materials um, when we get to preparing for our clinical manufacturing process. In terms of composition and specifications, we may be able to cross-reference a master file um, that's already on file at FDA. Um, in general, we need, however, to at minimum uh, be able to demonstrate that we have reviewed the certificate analysis and that the uh, raw material is what we expect it to be. Now, one very useful tool in, uh, uh, in qualifying raw materials is USP Chapter 1043, Ancillary Materials for Cell, Gene, and Tissue Engineered Products. And this discusses um, in very useful detail um, how we qualify ancillary materials, how we identify them, select them, demonstrate their suitability, and so forth, and how we qualify our vendors 
are suppliers of raw material agents. In particular, their quality control and quality assurance systems. It also addresses performance testing. We touched on this a bit in the previous slide, but it's worth emphasizing. Fundamentally, does the make raw material function as intended in your particular manufacturing process? The standard functional assay for a reagent doesn't uh, necessarily demonstrate how the reagent is going to work in your process. Cytokines and growth factors, for example, carry out a number of different functions. And the standard functional assay that might have been used um, to achieve FDA approval or to uh, test the reagent uh, uh, for the certificate analysis, that doesn't necessarily get at the function that the reagent is going to be carrying out in this particular manufacturing process. So you're going to need to do performance testing to show that it works as you need it to. In the case of ancillary materials, which, as we mentioned previously, aren't intended to be present in the final product, we're going to need to assess residual levels. We need to demonstrate that we've removed them adequately or reduced their level um, adequately uh, in the final product. Finally, bear in mind that ancillary material qualification is risk-based. Higher risk raw materials will require more extensive qualification. And USP Chapter 1043 includes a very useful four-tiered risk classification um, uh, of uh, raw materials going from the lowest risk, Tier 1, to the highest risk, Tier 4. More on that in the next slide. So in addition to qualifying the raw materials themselves, we also need to qualify the suppliers of those raw materials. Bear in mind that the ultimate responsibility for the quality of your raw materials is you, the manufacturer of the cell therapy products. So it's essential that you understand how the supplier of your raw materials uh, control the quality of those raw materials. Do they have adequate uh, quality assurance and quality control in place? which in turn allows you to demonstrate that you have adequate control and quality assurance in place. You want to implement your supplier qualification program as early as possible in development because qualification can take time. You may need to work with the supplier of your raw material to help them bring up um, their quality standards and their quality systems. In other words, you may need to take corrective action. You want to begin with the most critical raw materials in your manufacturing process, focusing on safety and focusing on function. You will almost certainly need more than just the certificate of analysis to determine the quality of your um, supplier, to qualify your suppliers. Um, you'll start by sending them a supplier qualification questionnaire. And depending on how critical the raw material item is, you may need to, in fact, conduct a site visit audit and so forth. Again, you want to follow a tiered risk-based approach, um, the risk-based approach that underlines all of regulation of cell therapy products and all of manufacturing of cell therapy products. Now, in addition to qualifying the raw material items themselves, we need to qualify the suppliers of our raw materials. Ultimately, the final responsibility for the quality of raw materials is you. The uh, it lies with you, the manufacturer of the cell therapy products. So you, in turn, need to assure that the suppliers of the raw materials that you use have adequate quality systems in place, have adequate control of their quality. You want to implement the qualification program um, for your suppliers early in clinical development because supplier qualification can take a while, um, particularly if you need to work with the suppliers with the manufacturers of your raw materials to help bring them up to an appropriate level of quality. You want to begin with the most critical raw materials and focus on safety and function. You will need more than the certificate of analysis alone to establish the quality of the supplier of the raw material. Um, and so you may need to, you will need to um, start with a supplier qualification questionnaire. And in some cases, you may need to follow that with a site visit um, to perform a uh, qualification audit. Overall, you'll want to follow a risk-based approach, the same approach that you take to all of manufacturing and development of cell therapy products and the risk-based approach that underlies all of regulation of cell therapy products. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take questions. John, back to you.
Thank you, Scott, and thanks again to Drs. Lazarus and Chalmers for giving a timely and concise overview of a number of critical aspects that surround the development, manufacture, regulation, and application of cell therapy products. You've definitely struck a chord with our audience, so let's take the first question. All right, guys. Uh, first question is for Dr. Lazarus. Dr. Lazarus, what is the best starting cellular tissue for generating MSCs? MSSCs. So, so uh, there is a variety of tissues that can be used. Um, marrow was originally the first tissue that was uh, uh, used because of the ease of collecting marrow, but uh, adipose tissue is being used increasingly. Uh, there is a difference between the number of starting cells uh, for a tissue, for example, such as adipose tissue versus uh, mononuclears from marrow, and the potency may be different among these uh, different uh, cellular therapy starting materials. Placental tissue is now being used more frequently, and some, sometimes these cells uh, from placenta, for example, are grown in three dimensions, which change the properties. So uh, I don't think there's any one best tissue. Uh, it depends on what your uh, area uh, is, uh, of target is and defining potency and going from there. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Chalmers, our next question is for you. Uh, one of our audience members would like to know, concerning bioreactor bio and spark uh, in a single pass or continuous flow system, can culture media be sufficiently gassed prior to use in a bioreactor? Are there additives uh, that help to maintain sufficient gas solubility in the media for single pass system? Um, to start with, gassing and sparging are usually a a uh, issue related to cell density and how large your culture is. So it's more of a question of what scale you're trying to scale up to and work at. Um, that's a it's a little tough question just to, to give a real simple answer to it because yeah you can spar you can make sure the air is saturated beforehand. You know up to probably one liter systems. You can do it with surface gassing as long as you have sufficient mixing. Um, so I think I'm just giving you a high-level answer to that because it's going to be very specific to the scale and the system you're working with. Although in the long run, I think we're going to, as a community, need to address the question of larger scale and how to sparge them. It's coming. And I think that's still an open question. All righty. Thank you for that. Uh, our next question is for Dr. Berger. Dr. Berger, uh, audience member asked, if our cell therapy protocol is destined for the clinic, is it uh, beneficial to do the initial research with GMP reagents to make the transition smooth uh, in the later stages? Yeah. Um, it's certainly advantageous to make the transition to uh, GMP manufactured uh, raw materials early in development. Maybe not at the R stage of R&D, but certainly at the D stage, uh, the development stage. In general, the earlier you make a change like that, the easier that transition is going to be. Later in development, um, uh, particularly once you're into clinical development, it's going to require a lot more in the way of bridging comparability studies um, to support those kinds of changes, whereas earlier in development, uh, particularly before you get to the clinic, it's going to be much, much simpler. So, yeah, um, transitioning to um, GMP manufactured reagents earlier on in, uh, uh, or at the very least, well-controlled and well-qualified uh, raw materials is going to be much easier. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Lazarus, we have another question for you. Uh, audience member asks, what is your opinion uh, on how to compare transitioning from FPS media to platelet lysate or serum-free media? So I uh, I think that the answer to the previous question is similar to this question. Uh, if a uh, center is uh, planning on making a modification in their support and supporting media, obviously one needs to have this approach validated. And uh, sometimes it seems uh, 
relatively straightforward and you run into lots of problems and from an one needs to uh, really pursue this uh, empirically um, I showed some data uh, comparing but we have a lot of trials that we've undertaken where we've contacted uh, vendors that make serum free media and obtained aliquots because there's obviously differences among the different uh, serum free media and uh, there can be certain differences from uh, platelet lysate e even from batch to batch so this uh, gets to be an issue if one is planning on a bigger uh, clinical investigation where you certainly don't want to be changing lysates in midstream so I think the best way to do this is to really do a, a, a series of validations and try to optimize this uh, in the laboratory on a small scale and then scaling up as we just heard uh, one might run into additional problems but I, I think it certainly can be done and, and uh, it's uh, a necessary evil. All righty, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Chalmers, we have a question for you. The uh, question asks, for microcarrier scale-up of cells, how would you propose harvesting the cells without using porcine-derived enzymes and without damaging the cells? Uh, this is particularly difficult as the microcarriers tend to clump uh, as the culture ages. Yeah, that's another great question that is still being pursued by a number of labs. One of maybe my best suggestion is uh, some work that's come out of England. One of the authors is Alvin Nino, and I think Hewlett, I believe is his name. Um, they suggesting using an enzyme and ad increasing the agitation enough to uh, have them come off, and they claim they can remove them without damage for harvest. Uh, I'm not sure which enzyme they're using, though. If it's porcine, it might be. And that's a great another problem in question. Um, that's related to probably the bigger question of using any animal-derived product in your culture and how you're going to deal with it in a regulation situation. Um, you know, I wish I had answers, but this field is just starting. Well, I shouldn't say just starting; it's developing. But there's there's a huge number of issues out there. I've heard rumors that there is a microcarrier that will that can dissolve which might be the real solution to all this if you could have it dissolve without introducing any potentially negative compounds into your system that would be the best stop at that point all righty thank you for that uh dr berger um, question uh, the audience member would like to know is IL-2 going to need to be assayed or residual assay prior to infusion into myeloma patients? Yeah. If the IL-2 is being used as an ancillary material in the manufacturing process, in other words, something that you're using in the manufacturing process but that isn't specifically intended to be in the final product, that isn't specifically intended to support the function of the cells in the final product, then you're going to need to assay for it to demonstrate that you have depleted it to sufficiently low levels. And that's usually defined as either um, undetectable by a, an appropriately sensitive assay, um, no fair cheating by using a relatively insensitive assay, by the way, um, or um, by demonstrating that you've removed it to a sufficiently, uh, uh, by a sufficiently large number of logs, by six logs, things of that nature. Um, but it really depends on what the expected function um, of the IL-2 is in your manufacturing process and what its likely um, uh, effect might be if it was unintentionally um, at uh, significant levels in the, in the final product. So the most honest answer is it depends. Um, incidentally, a quick uh, comment on the previous question. I agree with Dr. Chalmers. It's an excellent one. Um, there are... Uh, some alternatives, or at least two alternatives, in the way of um, recombinant uh, trips and alternatives, things like triply select, um, which might work, um, and uh, uh, as possible replacements for uh, porcine trips. Just a, a quick thought. All righty, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Chalmers. We have another question for you. Uh, our audience member asks, why not establish cell banks? with cells that have not maxed out in passage. Protocols exist from the monoclonal antibody days that may be worth reviewing. Um, I guess I have two points on that. 
I'm not sure what you mean by monoclonal antibody because the majority of the biopharmaceuticals that are produced commercially now or biotherapeutic you know, human use are made in CHO cells, which are an immortal cell line to start with. So there is not an issue of passage limitation at all with those. Um, the question, though, of developing a larger bank is probably definitely worthwhile, although even that, how do you get a large bank of cells from a single clone or a small sample and keep it low passage? It's always a problem. You have to passage them to scale them up. Then finally, my last point about that and answer, and it's probably partially related to another question, so I'm trying to answer two of them here. It's going to involve the FDA regulations or just regulatory questions in general. If you had an immortalized cell line, that right there raises a lot of questions as should that ever be used as cell therapy. So we in the cell in the production side of things, unfortunately or fortunately, don't get to really dictate in general the cells that are going to end up being the therapeutic cells, unless we just can't grow them at all. So I think the biggest an answer to your question pushed back to the researcher and clinician. Did they define what we're going to need to work with? Okay, great. And it looks like we have time for uh, one last short question. Uh, for Dr. Berger, uh, audience member would like to know, could you describe what is clinical grade raw material? Yeah. Um, this is perhaps more properly termed pharmaceutical, uh, a pharmaceutical, a USP a reagent, um, an FDA approved reagent if you're in Europe. That would be an EP, a European pharmaceutical um, grade reagent, something that's referenced in uh, the USP or the EP, something that's been approved by FDA. Um, we tend to use the shorthand clinical grade, although properly speaking, we really ought to probably say um, pharmaceutical. All righty, thank you. Uh, and with that, it looks like we've come to the end of our webinar. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that the webinar will be archived uh, on our site at www.genengnews.com for six months. So if you've missed parts of it uh, and you'd want to watch it again, uh, you can do that. Or if you'd like to forward it to your friends and colleagues, we recommend that. I'd like to thank Dr. Berger, Dr. Chalmers, and Dr. Lazarus again for their informative presentations. And I'd like to thank the audience for their attention and thoughtful questions. And a very special thanks to Biotechni for sponsoring this webinar. So hopefully we'll see you again at another Gen webinar in the near future. Goodbye for now.